Rule number one, keep them away from bright light. Rule number two, do not get them wet. And rule number three, the most important one, never feed them after midnight. These are the rules for taking care of the Mogwai, an adorable little creature that looks like the unnatural result of Yoda's drunken rendezvous with an Ewok. <laughs> and you better take extra care to follow these rules, too. Otherwise, the Mogwai will cocoon and re-emerge into a vicious race of evil monsters that threatens to ruin Christmas for the small town of Kingston Falls. From director Joe Dante and producer Steven Spielberg, this is the 1984 holiday classic Gremlins. I'm Connor Zagari. And I'm Austin Johnson. And happy holidays from Filmgasm. Happy Wednesday, listeners. Time to get Christmassy up in here with the first of our two holiday-themed horror episodes, the other being next week's. We're talking Gremlins, the bodacious 80s classic that's partly responsible for the creation of the PG-13 rating, the other film being Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Last week's double carpenter whammy of The Thing and Escape from New York was so much fun. Hope you enjoyed them as much as we did. In just a few weeks, it'll be Weird Shit Wednesday, and we're going to dive into the Joel Schumacher Batman movies, Batman Forever and Batman and Robin, two ridiculous films that most comic fans have disowned entirely. We'll tackle these two neon disasters and mock them relentlessly, while at the same time pointing out some of their positive elements. I'm sure we'll find them somewhere. Yeah, no, it's going to be fun. Bring them back to life, you know, a little bit. I I hate to say it, but I really do enjoy watching those movies. Yeah, yeah. I grew up with them. They're my Batman movies. It's going to be a great time. Yeah, (laughs) It's going to be a good time. Uh, Buckle up for that one. Oh, hell yeah. Got one rewind for you. A quick update on episode five, Quentin Tarantino. Tarantino has apparently abandoned his planned Star Trek movie in favor of doing something smaller and more meaningful to him personally. After all, it is going to be his final film if he commits to his original declaration. And I am okay with this. Yeah. Oh, we've we've talked about this. uh, This has been an ongoing thread throughout (laughs) the whole podcast. Quentin Tarantino's Star Trek. And just you and I in our our lives. Like, we we love him and we really want him. Like you said, if he is sticking to his word, we want him to go out with something similar to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah. Something original, more his. Original, uh, some sort of kind of love letter. You know, yeah, something personal that kind of, yeah, that sticks. And Paramount, they have way too much to lose with an R-rated Star Trek. Yeah. That's an image that's going to be tainted forever <laughs> if Tarantino gets his yeah, hands man, on that. I, I just don't, I'm not used to uh, p- pinning Tarantino with some sort of franchise or anything like yeah. that. I, I don't want to do that ever. Yeah. I haven't done it yet. Let's just keep it that way. <laughs> it's like you know? Paul Thomas Anderson doing a Bond film. It just yeah. doesn't work. It sounds I mean, cool on paper. Am I on board? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to see it, yeah. but I don't want you, you know. I yeah. know, right? You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, so. And for his tough. last movie, it should be something special. It should be his movie. Yeah. I'd like to see him finally tackle, like, a real horror film. That would be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Be, I mean, we got kind of that with Death Proof, mm-hmm. but not nearly the level, like, he could have gone. Maybe he will. Maybe the gloves will come completely <laughs> off now that he's like, ah, yeah. you guys see? Huh? <laughs> I'm the master. Or maybe he'll finally do Kill Bill 3. That, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, like, like, yeah, we're on board for anything. That's just, that's how it's always going to be, but I am personally happy as a fan of his that, you know, this is the news I expected all along. Yeah. Was eventually that he'd be like, you know what, I'm going to do my own thing. Yeah, he doesn't want the suits breathing down his neck. It's QT. Yeah, come on. Yeah. The second any Paramount exec tells him, like, well, you can't have Captain Kirk say fuck to the Klingon. Like, They're gonna, yeah, I can. Yeah, he's going to be like, uh... What was that? No, I've never heard that word before. What do you, what's this mean? <laughs> I don't like this. Yeah, he would freak the fuck out. <laughs> Say no again. <laughs> <laughs> Klingon, motherfucker, do you speak it? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I, re- I want and don't want this movie at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Spock, I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. Yeah, it'd be pretty cool. (laughs) Well, here's hoping. I don't know when Tarantino's final movie will happen. I mean, there was a four-year gap between Hateful Eight and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Well worth it. Yeah. So who knows? But we're anxiously waiting it. (laughs) Yeah, as always, yeah. So, prior to this podcast, had you seen Gremlins before? Yes, as a kid. Don't remember what age exactly. I remember, you know, being entertained, and this is like an iconic uh, symbol, the... You know, you see, yeah. well, yeah, you see like the stuffed animals everywhere, and it's just 
a thing that's just like a part of our culture. Yeah. Don't really know why, to be honest. Uh, like you said, what was your Yoda? <laughs> yeah, it's like Yoda fucked an Ewok. That's, yeah, that's what yeah. the Mogwai looks like to me. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. It's kind of creepy to me. I don't see why it's like a popular, like... Nobody questions that in the toy. movie either. They're like, nobody says, what the fuck is this animal? They're always just like, oh, that's adorable. Yeah, I'm like, nah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't, I haven't seen it, yeah, in years, and then, you know, I watched it uh, today, actually. And uh, it did not have the same yeah. <laughs> same effect as, as, a, as a kid, which is probably to be expected, but... Then again, you know, working at Draft House, uh, as we, we both used to, they, like, show this once a year at each of the... It's one of the Christmas rotations. Yeah, movies, at each yeah. of the screens. Uh, screens. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't understand that. I feel like there's more other or other movies that you could fill that two-hour gap with. I agree, big time. Because <laughs> you ha- you have to, you're, like, really picking and choosing each month. Um, I've never seen Jingle All the Way in one of those rotations. Yeah, you know, like, what I would love the fuck? To I, I totally understand. They do, like, they do Elf. They do Die Hard. I, yeah, man. There's the Home Alone like, Pizza Party. But for whatever reason, there's an audience for this, and I don't know who it is. I'm not quite sure. Um, I, I think it's probably a lot of Spielberg heads, people who are obsessed with I think it's a lot of people know. who, you know, never left the 80s. I think there's yeah. certain movies that people cling to because they refuse to admit they have an age well. And Gremlins is one of those movies for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, yeah, I mean, revisiting it was not, um, you know, th- there are aspects that were fun for sure. And there's, you know, young Corey Feldman. And you're like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> look at this guy. You know, it's there are aspects that are fun now looking back. But I don't quite understand why it has the uh, status status that it does. Yeah, me neither. That's that's I, I don't understand it. Yeah. It's weird. I, f- I felt this way. We, we did E.T. not too long ago. Mm-hmm. I don't feel as strongly about um, E.T. as I do Gremlins, but but it's kind of the same sort of feeling. I'm like, I don't quite understand why this is regarded. But E.T. has some like amazing scenes. This this never had a scene where I was like, wow. Yeah. I, it just kind of eh, just kind of came and went for me. I get it. Yeah. I've uh, I've seen this about three or four times now, and it just, yeah. it gets worse every time I watch it. I want to like it so much. Yeah, didn't you say you watched it like a year ago or something? Yeah, yeah. And I was, I was like, all right, I was kind of in and out. Yeah, I thought, you know, I'm gonna recommit to de- like, to, you know, this time I'm gonna watch the whole thing. I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna watch it critically. Yeah, and I fell asleep. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, it's tough. I tried to watch it critically, and I was like, I can't. I gotta just like this lay is back. Bad. And, <laughs> No, it's just not. It's not boring. It's, it's, it's boring. Yeah. yeah, that's really, that's really the best word for it. I, there, I mean, there's some satisfying scenes, like when the old lady gets, you know, hurled out the window. That's pretty satisfying. <laughs> but there's overall, it's just kind of lackadaisical. Like it just kind of goes along. Yeah. There's not much of a story here. No. And we'll, you know, we'll we'll get we'll dive into the plot, right. and we'll we'll find, you know, little bits and pieces here. But yeah, you know yeah. the drill. Yeah. So, Gremlins was released in 1984, the same weekend as Ghostbusters. Huh. So, great fucking weekend for movie fans. For a good weekend for Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> and these two films helped usher in a new popular subgenre of black comedies. You know, they, were, they started to combine you know, horror elements and comedy elements, and Gremlins and Ghostbusters were some of the forefronts of that. Ghostbusters is an infinitely better film. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. The Id- We're going to do Ghostbusters when I'm down the road. That's going to happen. For sure, yeah. I think it has to, yeah. The idea of Gremlins first appeared during World War II as an inside joke among pilots in the Royal Air Force. Whenever a plane suffered mechanical failure, the pilots would often joke about how the Gremlins were coming out of the woodwork to sabotage. There's also the classic 1963 Twilight Zone episode, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, starring William Shatner as a nervous flyer, who becomes convinced he sees a gremlin on the wing of his plane, ripping pieces off of it. It became one of the most popular episodes of the show, and was later remade in 1983 as one of the segments of Twilight Zone the movie. This segment starred John Lithgow as the nervous flyer, and was directed by George Miller. And Joe Dante, director of Gremlins, directed one of the other segments. How about that? Yeah. And that is the scariest segment of the Twilight Zone movie. <laughs> yeah, indeed. That is the strings of, like, in the score, John Lithgow's panicky performance. You can tell. Yeah, you're like, oh, it's heightened. It's, yeah. tough, it's tough for me to watch that at night. <laughs> That's a, that gets me every time. A- Any time. Yeah. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, the gremlin of, of the Twilight Zone helped make that show extremely popular. I, I, uh, I recently went to a special screening of five Twilight Zone episodes. So cool. And uh, regrettably, that was not one of them. But there was a well, documentary about... There's so many. Oh, yeah. yeah. There was a documentary about Rod Serling at the end of them. And 
they talked about filming this episode and how they did it on a budget on a soundstage in a plane that they had brought in and they filmed it in less than a day because they needed like they ran out of time and on a budget with a deadline and they delivered one of the most iconic episodes of television (laughs) ever made that's amazing to me man so cool (laughs) and it still holds up it's still creepy as fuck yeah yeah Yeah. oh man that show Arguably the best, yeah, greatest television. We can do a whole time. goddamn series on the Twilight Zone. Uh, yeah, that's a whole. That's <laughs> someone needs to make a a podcast just for that. I'm sure there is one, yeah. but uh, yeah, that's. I we can even. You poke that, <laughs> that that monster, and yeah, it's yeah. You know, it unfolds. Yeah, like you said, a whole series of podcasts. <laughs> well, Twilight Zone, the movie, will be one of ours. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, do. There you go. That'll yeah. be fun. Because yeah, we we focus on films here, but my God, Twilight Zone is like one of those that kind of tempts tempts you oh yeah <laughs> so much good content <laughs> Oof. both gremlins films were directed by cult director joe dante an unsung hero of the 80s whose other films include the howling twilight zone the movie inner space the burbs and small soldiers he's often overlooked in conversations about great 80s directors but he's definitely a contender i like joe dante's work for the most part me too yeah overall yeah like the burbs and small soldiers are probably my favorite of his the burbs yeah yeah legendary and then yeah small soldiers is like huge for me i had all those figures as kid as a kid and all yeah yeah small soldiers is it's gremlins with toys like it's the same movie yeah but (laughs) whatever (laughs) i relate to the yeah i relate to it or i did at the time i guess i watched it recently still holds up still still funny small soldiers i haven't seen it in a while yeah (laughs) i didn't realize frank langella was archer it's fucking great oh wow yeah Yeah. i had no idea (laughs) Dang, yeah. Yeah. That's great. So, such a great cast. Ugh. Gremlins was written by Chris Columbus, future director of the first two Harry Potter films. Gremlins was his fourth screenplay, and he was fresh out of NYU. We discussed his accomplishments as a director in the Harry Potter episode, but some of his writing accomplishments include The Goonies, Only the Lonely, Nine Months, and Christmas with the Cranks. So apart from The Goonies, not much to brag about. <laughs> <laughs> But still, I had no... Clue. The Goonies is one of my favorite movies. I had no idea Chris Columbus wrote it. Okay, The Goonies... Let's talk about The Goonies for a second. Okay. The Goonies is one of those where I do understand the the, the craze about it and the, the longevity that it's had. I, I get it. You watch it now, you're like, there's some pretty cool performances. There's some awesome like one-liners. And the story's pretty fucking good. Where is that in Gremlins, you know? <laughs> so I don't understand why, like you said, it's a, it's like an 80s thing, but it's like, okay, here's all these, there's some gold from the 80s. There is let's, tons of gold from Let's the hold 80s. on to that yeah. and leave the rest, you know? I agree. I didn't mean that, like, every, you know, 80s No, 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 I'm, yeah, yeah. Oh, I know you're yeah. a bigger 80s fan oh, than I am. Yeah, yeah that, that's... My that. all-time favorite movie ever, Back to the Future. Yeah. 1985. Therein lies, yeah. The, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then 1989, Back to the Future 2. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's a great... There's lots of cool stuff in that day. I mean, John Carpenter, yeah. Yeah, John Carpenter. <laughs> but there's some stuff that just only worked in the 80s. Yeah, and it, but it happens yeah. to be things that we hold on to. Like, like American yeah. culture is just held on Gremlins to. Gremlins is one of those. Another big one that fits that same profile for me is Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Yes. Oh, my God. That is a yeah. really ridiculous yes. movie. I don't, I don't get the appeal of that at Good. all. Thank you. Good call. It's a yeah. terrible fucking movie. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, you know... You, just Goonies is like the perfect example of like something that does and it's still like for everybody yes. still like still like someone who has no idea who any of these people are like whatever it doesn't matter some like 10 year old dude could watch this and be like yeah man that's a, that's a, that's an awesome movie you know I just don't feel that way about Gremlins man it's not it's not as like accessible and as um or just relatable and fun I, I don't know yeah, it's not you know it, it, it's yeah why do we it, it's just interesting what we pick and choose to hold on to like, as a, as a whole, you know, as a, as a culture, as a whole. It's true. And Gremlins is one of them. Like, it just 100% is. Like, it's one of those that people still go back to. It's still in their rotation. And it's like, here we are talking about it, you know? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Gremlins came from the sound of mice in Columbus's apartment at night, which creeped him out. He wrote Gremlins as a spec script to show potential employers that he was able to string a sentence together. It was never meant to be a movie until Steven Spielberg found it and grew interested and later bought it. So Gremlins was just the script that Columbus wrote to prove to people he could write a script. There was no... like He never thought this was going to be anything, let alone like the biggest success of Joe Dante's career. Yeah, yeah. Like, what? 
Zach Galligan was cast as Billy Peltzer, a geeky kid just trying to make ends meet, who becomes the caretaker of Gizmo the Mogwai. Galligan was an unknown actor at the time, and though he's found steady work to this day, he is still an unknown actor. The Gremlins films are his most well-known work. And frankly, he's, he's not, he doesn't really... He's not anything to brag about. It's kind of a forgettable lead. Yeah, <laughs> I'd say so. Phoebe Cates plays Kate, Billy's girlfriend. She was the biggest name the film could score, though she was known for playing the racy part of Linda Barrett in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Yeah, man. God knows how many VHS copies of that film have been worn down from constant rewinding of that pool scene. Well, and what's great is Judge Reinhold is also in this. Yeah, and yeah. Judge he's, Reinhold. He's the one who's like... Gerald. Yeah. <laughs> Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Also, not good. <laughs> I've seen that. Hot take. I've, I haven't seen that in a long time. I remember liking it. I was like, I was like fourteen. I was not yeah. supposed to be watching it. So that's yeah, probably yeah, yeah. why. Yeah, I own it. I still own it because yeah. I I had like a huge craze where I was like, I need to watch all of those high school dazed fast times. Yeah. Uh, it's not good. <laughs> you watch it now and you're like, oh boy. <laughs> Sean Penn's great. But yeah, the rest of the movie and Spicoli. particularly Phoebe Cates is not good in, in uh, Fast Times. She's, she's gorgeous, but like, you know, no, that, that, that movie's just not good. It's another <laughs> one of those 80s ones where I'm like, why? <laughs> why are we holding on to that? <laughs> Phoebe Cates was big stuff in the 80s, but she never escaped. And she hasn't really done anything of note since Gremlins. Or I think Gremlins 2. Was she in that one? Yeah, I think so. I haven't seen it, so yeah. She's been married to actor Kevin Klein since 1989. I didn't know that. Neither did I. They have two kids. That's great. Good for them. <laughs> Phoebe and Kev. <laughs> Howie Mandel is the voice of Gizmo. And Mandel is best known these days as the host of the innocuous game show Deal or No Deal, which ran from 2005 to 2019. It's been, gotten a revival. Oh, wow. That is the most boring fucking game show in the world. It's just briefcases. There's no trivia. There's no skill involved. You're just oh no. It's yeah. just dudes picking from a sea of hot babes. It's just guessing. Just pick a number. Just like ah. And this ran for 14 years. <laughs> Jesus yeah. Christ, dude, dude, yeah. <laughs> I've thought about that show a lot. And not only the show, like, do people watch the show? But people are obsessed with it. They play. There's games at like Dave and Buster's yeah. arcade games. There's casino games. What are we doing? What? How is there's this? There's the home game. I've seen that. There's a DVD home game. And, and yeah, what are we doing? We're just we're just selecting numbers. We're just picking briefcases off uh. of like ah yeah. I think I think I'm gonna go with yeah. I think I'm gonna go with that brunette over there. On 24. Yeah, we'll go with that one. What? What? Like you said, there's no skill involved. Whatsoever, and that's when I'm out on a. He on a calls game show. The, the bank. There's nobody fucking up there. Oh my god, that, like, that stupid. Let me, t- let me see what I can do for you. Bullshit screen of a guy, like yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, dude, that show. And, Howie, a, and Howie Mandel is just a, a strange, it's strange, a very weird man. Strange fellow. <laughs> What's he on now? America's Got Talent or whatever? I don't or? fucking follow his career. Yeah. <laughs> no, neither do I. Neither do I. But he's on another show now, which that's one of those shows. Whichever one he's on, like just fired Gabrielle Union. Uh, which yeah, fuck that. How would you ever fire her? Um, for I, I don't want to say why exactly, but what I looked up was like ridiculous reasons. Is that the sh- same show where Simon Cowell is being like accused of uh, inappropriate behavior? See, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't follow that shit. It's fuck. I just hear it in passing. It's not my world. Well, oh, man, yeah, I don't know. I'm not quite sure. I, I know like it used to be America's Got Talent. Used to be like the panel was insane. It was like David Hasselhoff. And Howard Stern, it was like, what is going on? Talent being the uh, word in quotes there. America's got talent. Yeah, at one point in one of those seasons, like in the top ten, there was a air, like, air band that they played. They all played air instruments. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. Anytime I start to question anything I'm good at, I'm going to remember that. <laughs> At least I'm not playing fake instruments anytime, on TV. Anytime you feel bad about anything, like anything whatsoever, just think about that. Think about guys competing with no instruments. How far did they get? They, I, I, they got to like the top ten. Jesus Christ. Yeah, people people voted. They didn't win, did they? No, no. Okay. I, well, I don't remember. Fuck. I, I don't know. Like, I, don't, I, I, I have never like really watched these shows, but like my parents did, and I've seen them, you know, they're... 
people always share that shit on like fucking Facebook, you know. I, I, I just it's always either shows. a dude who trained his dog to do something cool. Yeah, yeah. A five year old girl singing with the power of fucking Beyonce. Yeah. Or that, but reversed. An old person singing with the power of Beyonce. It's always a singer or a dog. That's all. Yeah. All I ever see. Or some magic trick. <laughs> yeah, everything. <laughs> Everything in between is some, like, some Eastern European guy, like, cutting himself, you know, like, cutting himself I open, like, oh, magic, you know. I saw one that was ridiculous. It was a guy who did, uh, who snapped his fingers, like, super fast. <laughs> <laughs> it was ridiculous. He's just, <clears throat> he's just there going, like, like, I was like, are you fucking kidding me? This, this guy's on TV. <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Amazing. Howie Mandel. <laughs> no deal. <laughs> I love how he always fist bumps people because he's like... He's a germaphobe. <laughs> Won't shake their hand. <laughs> oh, Howie, don't ever shave that soul patch off, my man. Please don't. Hey, I'm Brian. Hey. I remember he played a cult leader on Monk once. And that that's was, perfect. Yeah, it was, it was That's perfect. about right, yeah. <laughs> Dealer no deal. Those fans, yeah. That's a cult. <laughs> totally. Let's, Let's watch people press a button or push a box over a button. <laughs> yeah. Worst. Anyways. <laughs> Going back into the cast, Hoyt Axton plays Randall Peltzer, aspiring inventor and surprisingly good father who brings Gizmo home as a Christmas gift for his son who already has a dog. <laughs> Which... Yeah, that's a... I, I don't know. Typically, if your kid has a pet like that, you don't get him another pet. Yeah, running out of, running out of ideas, I guess, is what's going on. Yeah. Axton was a songwriter who owned the record label Jeremiah Records. He wrote these songs, Joy to the World and Never Been to Spain, for the band Three Dog Night. And his mother, May Boren Axton, actually wrote Heartbreak Hotel for Elvis Presley. So he came from some cool stock. He died in 1999 at age 61 of a heart attack. And it's kind of weird that after, you know, with that kind of career that he ended up being the dad in Groans. Yeah. <laughs> That's what, yeah, yeah. That's the peak. <laughs> Corey Feldman appears as Pete Fountain, a neighbor friend of Billy's. Feldman was another king of the 80s who never found his groove outside of his childhood. And God knows he's tried. <laughs> he will not go away. No. No matter how much America wants him to, Corey Feldman will not go away. <laughs> this is my neighborhood. <laughs> you remember a few years ago when he like did an impromptu concert at a baseball game, and no. everyone was like, "Why is this happening?" And the people who ran the game had to like apologize to people. <laughs> that I this, don't. I didn't know about that. It was like a minor league, like oh, local yeah, game. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And he was just there. To, he was supposed to do like a book signing, and he brought his band. Ugh, it was embarrassing. <laughs> He's trying to get the crowd riled up, and everyone's just looking at him like, what is going on right now? The <laughs> Orange County Iguanas, let's go! You know, just some backwards... What it's the It's called hell? something like the Corey Feldman Truth Movement, I think it's called. Like, it's ridiculous, man. He's a, he's a goddamn joke. <laughs> oh, man. Some of his biggest 80s hits include The Goonies, The Lost Boys, Stand By Me... Friday the 13th, the final chapter, The Burbs, and License to Drive. I mean, come on. <laughs> what a decade. Yeah. And then he was, uh, he was the voice of, I think, Donatello in a few of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies. Yeah, he's, you know, like he's, you said, he's here and there everywhere. Yeah. Doing all kinds of random crap. He wants so bad to be famous again. <laughs> <laughs> he, he always will be just because of this decade. Yeah, but he'll never be oh, 80s Corey Feldman no, famous again. No, it's impossible. <laughs> That's done. You have to become a good actor to keep going. You don't have to necessarily be a good actor. You just have to be... People want to have to care about your career. And yeah. And that's not going to yeah. happen again. No, not like... No. Until he's, like, you know, dead. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of the best thing he can do for his career at this point. It was just really sad, but yeah, you're right. It's like they... Jay-Z has a line where he's like, they don't, you know, miss you until you're dead or you're gone. So on that note, I'm leaving after the song. It's like, that's amazing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. Uh, Jay Z's music is now on Spotify for all those people. They're on Spotify. <laughs> it's <laughs> right good on. news. Do you know the Who has a new album? Yeah, I saw that too. Yeah. Fuck. How about that? I'm intrigued. 
Me, of course, yeah. Finally, Dick Miller plays Murray Futterman, Billy's neighbor. Miller was a big character actor who worked with Joe Dante a lot, also appearing in The Howling, The Burbs, Inner Space, and Small Soldiers. Miller died earlier this year at age 90 of natural causes. And he's a bit part dude who shows up all the time. Mm-hmm. He's in The Terminator. Like, the guy just never stopped working. There's a list of that, guys. Yeah. He's there. Dick Miller? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he's there. Yeah. That, that's that's a, a, a cult led by John C. McKinley. Uh, <laughs> yes. The ultimate that guy. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Cox. Yeah. <laughs> have, you, have you seen uh, Stealing Harvard? No. By any chance? I have not. It's like a low-key comedy that I think he would adore, and he he has a part that is like lights out. Uh, yeah. It just Sweet. you know, you would love it. It's very okay. funny. I, I don't I don't own it. My brother does. Uh, I got to find a way to get to it though, because it's one of those it's like 2003, just very very dry, just hilarious movie. Sweet. Right. You love it. Yeah. <laughs> right on, man. Love John C. McGinley. Yeah. He. It's but, like. I don't know if I can say my favorite role of John C. McGinley. It's kind of hard. To... Yeah, <laughs> there's all these random ones. He had a bit on Frasier. I really liked. Yes, where he played yeah. like a plumber. He does all he has Scrubs. I mean, yeah, yeah. Scrubs you know? is the best. Uh, yeah, yeah, and this in stealing Harvard, he's like just very abrupt and aggressive, and he's he's a cop, so it's like <laughs> perfect. You know, he was the funniest part of Wild Hogs. Agreed. Yeah, he's in the, he's in this movie called Kid Cannabis. Have you seen that? <laughs> no. He's a uh, like he like grows a shit ton of marijuana in his backyard. And at one point, he's just, like, hanging out with these guys smoking, and you're like, this doesn't fit. <laughs> John C. McGinley, like, growing weed all over his... <laughs> nah. <laughs> I don't believe it. I was really surprised to see him in The Rock. Yes! Like, there is a good one. Yeah, just one of the call. soldiers. Oh, outside, the, like, the Rock, Tony dude. Todd. The Rock like, is a very rewatchable movie. Oh, yeah. Just like, oh, yes. <laughs> scene after scene. Losers always whine about their best. <laughs> Winners go home and fuck the prom queen. <laughs> Jesus. One line. Sean Connery, man. <laughs> Ruth, ruthless. Oh, that's a great movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, Gremlins has an IMDb score of 7.3, a Rotten Tomatoes score of 84%. It was a massive success, grossing $153 million on a budget of $11 million. <laughs> Huge for the 80s. Incredible. Yeah, that's just, that's remarkable. And let's talk about the plot. Let's go into this. So, we meet Randall Peltzer. He's a struggling inventor who's just kind of wandering around Chinatown. (laughs) Not a good, you know, not a good match there. Something's going to, something bad's going to happen. All right. You just got to, a guy who, who you know, whose dream is failing and he's just wandering around Chinatown looking for Christmas presents. (laughs) That's that's just weird to me. Like, like this, and he goes to this one store, (coughs) excuse me, and he sees this little creature called a mogwai, which is actually the Cantonese word for devil, or gremlin, depending on who you're talking to, depending on your dialect, I guess, and the owner, Mr. Wing, refuses to sell the creature to Randall, despite Randall saying, like, give me 200 bucks, come on, <laughs> he's persistent, he doesn't even know what the fuck this thing is, but he's like, this, my son would love this, <laughs> Yeah. if my dad just showed up to. with like a weird looking creature I've never seen in my life, and said, you have to take care of this now. <laughs> That's not a gift. That's a goddamn curse. Yeah, no thanks. <laughs> Don't you know the new video game came out, Dad? You idiot. My God. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take nothing over a Mogwai. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just give me fucking $10 to go get some food or something. I don't know. <laughs> you know give me a handshake. Yeah. I, I don't need... Pat that. on the back, yeah. yeah. I'd rather have that than this fucking monster. <laughs> but the guy's grandson says, meet me out back. And <laughs> sells... The Mogwai to Randall. Like, how did he expect this to go with his granddad? Who was pretty insistent on the Mogwai not being for sale. Like, he's just going to come back in, the thing's going to be gone, and he's just going to be like, oh, well. Yeah. Mm. Money's money. No, this is clearly important to him. <laughs> and he he sells the Mogwai to Randall and says, all right, look, there's three rules you got to always follow. One, don't expose the thing to bright light. Two, do not let it come into contact with water, which makes me wonder, what the hell does this thing live on? And most importantly, never feed it after midnight. Another brings up another question. Isn't it always after midnight? This is my biggest problem with the whole movie. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. So, and then like at 5 a.m. it's all good now when the sun starts coming up or, or what? I, don't, I hate fucking rules like this in movies. And they, like, lay them out for you like they're these Ten Commandments or something. I'm like, what? 
<laughs> all of them, are, yeah, all of them I question. <laughs> what? Yeah. Whatever. It's almost like this is a prank. But, like, uh, you know, how does it work with time zones? Like, exactly. It makes no sense. I don't like that. It's, it's like, like so like, easily broken, the plot, yeah. uh, after two minutes of the movie. <laughs> like, wait, what? I, remember, I I paused it when I was watching today. I was like, hold on. <laughs> after midnight. <laughs> That's, uh, that's and it's so famous. Too. That's such that's, that's such, such a, a mind bending question. question. <laughs> it's become such a famous '80s quote. You I, people who've never seen this movie have heard the, the phrase "never feed it after midnight." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's yeah, so un, it's so unearned. <laughs> Ugh. So Randall goes home to Kingston Falls, where he gives the Mogwai to his son Billy, and Billy works in the local bank where uh, he his dog Barney has started a feud with this old Scrooge-like woman named Mrs. Deagle who kind of owns the whole town. Yeah. And she keeps threatening to kill his dog, which is uh, pretty fucked up. Very <laughs> fucked up. What a weird community. Yeah. yeah. Like, she says something like, I don't want your money, I want your dog. Yeah. Like, that's fucked. Jesus. No! Take, take, take this, this take this weird gremlin thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't feed it after midnight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and water. Yeah, water. No, no. So what do I do? What? All right. Oh my God. She's like so cartoonishly evil, yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> it's fr- it's kind of frustrating. Yeah. Uh, Randall names the Mogwai Gizmo, and Billy is kind of like he's not he doesn't react to this thing as a normal person would. He's just like, oh, it's so cute. Thanks, Dad. I'm gonna make him my best friend forever. And the dog's like, fuck you, Billy. <laughs> I, just, I know he's thinking it. Yeah. <laughs> I thought we were in this together, man. <laughs> that old bitch is going to kill me, man. <laughs> I want this movie from the dog's perspective. See what happens. <laughs> oh, my man. God. It's like Toy Story. <laughs> He's Woody. <laughs> so Billy's friend Pete <laughs> accidentally spills a, water on, uh, spills a glass of water on Gizmo. And Pete's like, <clears throat> what, 10? Yeah. yeah. Why is this teenager yeah. friends with a 10-year-old? <laughs> I, I don't know. That's another strange... 80s. I don't know. Yeah, it's Corey Feldman. It's an unwritten rule of the 80s. Corey Feldman has to appear in every fifth movie that comes out that year. Yeah. That's the rule. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> you have to. As n- this fell in the cycle. No matter ah, how shit. little sense it makes to the plot, you gotta have Corey Feldman in there. Hey, Joe, we got... We got Corey again. <laughs> Feldman or Haim? Feldman again. <laughs> <laughs> and when the water hits Gizmo, he freaks out, and five more Mogwai fly out of his back in these little pods, which is a very interesting. That maybe the old Ch- maybe the Chinese kids should have said like, "Oh, don't spill water on it, or you're gonna have a shit ton of these things." <laughs> like a little elaboration, and don't feed it after midnight because they're gonna turn into vicious monsters. Yeah, yeah, like they will want to eat you. Maybe yeah. they'd be a little bit more careful. Yeah. <laughs> They had been playing the fucking pronoun game. Ugh. There's so many problems in this movie. It's, it's crazy. And these new Mogwais are pieces of shit. They're aggressive little bastards. They but, are, but yeah. but not scary. No, and not like they're Chihuahuas on crack. Yeah, yeah. And they have a leader, this little fat bastard named Stripe, who has this tuft of hair, and uh, he's clearly our bad guy. <laughs> Like, they might as well just called him Stripe Bad Guy. Like, yeah. we get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Billy shows one of these things to his t- t- science teacher, Mr. Hansen, makes more of these fucking things. He puts water on one of them, and more of them come out. And this guy's just like, can I keep one of these things? <laughs> yeah. For uh, research? <laughs> it's weird the way he says research, almost like he's going to do something. <laughs> <laughs> That's not really research. <laughs> and back at home, Stripe's gang uh, manages to trick Billy into feeding them after midnight by cutting the power cord to his clock and making him think it's like 11.30. So fucked. Yeah. And they he feeds him chicken, and they eat it like fucking piranhas. And Gizmo but, doesn't want any. But, you know, there's other time zones where it's they're like three hours ahead, you know, so... Who knows? Does it matter? I, I don't know. Apparently not. I guess just in each time zone, I guess, the the Mogwai operate 
depending on what time zone it is. I guess they inherently know. They're like an iPhone. They inherently know. <laughs> they... Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. I think it's weird that Gizmo has no interest in the chicken. Almost like he's a grown-up. Yeah. Mogwai, like, oh, no, I know it's after midnight. No, thank you. I'm good. <laughs> My body clock says no. Yeah. Oh, my bib is put away. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, I couldn't possibly. Yes. And I've already I've already washed the dishes. Yeah, I couldn't. Yeah. Mm-mm, no. Ugh. So they start. You know, the next morning, Billy finds a whole bunch of cocoons, and uh, Hanson's Mogwai also becomes a cocoon because he ate after midnight, and. Everyone's like, "What is going on here?" And the cocoons hatch, and they emerge as these r- vicious little creepy reptile monsters, gremlins, that tortures. They torture Gizmo, try to kill Billy's mother, and that's kind of an awesome scene where Mom goes ape shit on these gremlins, yeah, and stabs one of them, it's microwaves another one yeah. of them. Fuck! I mean, that thing blows up in the microwave. That was pretty awesome. Way to go, Mom! <laughs> Science oven. <laughs> and she's actually she's Lorraine's mom from Back to the Future. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, good call. Pretty cool stuff. Stella. Well, you're always going to know the cast members of Back to the yes, Future yes, and yes. what other movies they appear in. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hansen gets fucking killed by his gremlin. Like, wow. Brutality. Yeah, man, these things are killing people. I wish they would have made it scary. Mm-hmm. All the gremlins are killed, except Stripe, who escapes the house, goes to the wo- uh, ends up in the local Y, jumps in the swimming pool. And creates an army of these fucking things. And Which they, is what I would have done a long time ago if I'm striped, but yeah. <laughs> and he just starts, they'd start rip, wrecking this town to pieces. And I do like the music of Gremlins, the like you know weird, cheerful theme. Yeah. Jerry Goldsmith is just a master. Yeah, time and time again. <laughs> Billy tries to warn the cops, and they don't believe him. And that reminded me of the scene in The Goonies where Chunk is on the phone with the cops. And the cop doesn't believe him because he kept telling all these outlandish stories before, including one about these little creatures that multiply <laughs> yeah, when you pour yeah. water on them. That's, that's great. <laughs> I love that. Ah, cool. So, obviously, the gremlins start fucking people up. They're, you know, they're tearing this town apart. And they get Mrs. Deagle, the old miserly lady, who... <laughs> it's, it's so funny because she so deserved it. She gets launched through the window on a stair lift. And it's oh, so great. Like, just zoom, right epic. out the fucking window. Epic. <laughs> Hello, chum. <laughs> Does she fly in front of the moon like E.T., or is that a different movie? Yeah, yeah she... Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's... Yeah. <laughs> That's there. Yeah, I wish you wouldn't have pointed that. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <clears throat> so at the local bar, the gremlins start tearing it down, and... uh this is the scene I had a lot of issues with because it's really dated. There's so many part, like bits in this scene that are just ridiculous. Like, you know, the gremlins in different costumes and doing stupid shit. It's supposed to be, like, climactic. Yeah, it's, it's rough. Yeah, I'm just out at that point. Oh, yeah, I'm, yeah. At this point, I'm pretty... I'm heavily checking stuff on my phone now. Like, oh, let's see what else I can... And Kate, Billy's girlfriend, flashes him with a camera, escapes into the bank with Billy and Gizmo. And while hiding, and this is one of the strangest parts of the movie, Kate explains why she hates Christmas, because she found her father dead in a chimney dressed as Santa Claus. Okay, wow. Jesus. Why is the... I mean... Why is that in this script? It's so out of nowhere. It's That, that is like something that that uh, uh, Columbus wrote, and like, no one read it? And like, they missed that part? <laughs> oh no, this... I was reading in the, into the trivia. That was a highly contentious... Like a th- uh, bit between Joe Dante and Spielberg. Dante really, really wanted to keep that. Spielberg thought it was too much and wanted it out. And he's the money. It's not really like it's too much. It's just weird. But he told Joe, like, he basically decided, all right, I'm the money here, but it's Joe Dante's movie and he has final say. Yeah. And so it ended up being in the movie. And it's just really strange. It's a very odd. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a scene in Gremlins 2 that mimics this where she had something even crazier happen to her. <laughs> it's weird. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Billy and Kate realize the town is quiet and the uh, the gremlins are watching Snow White in the local theater. Why? Who fucking knows? And they set off an explosion killing all the gremlins except Stripe. How fucking convenient. 
They all get them. They get all the gremlins in one fell swoop. Almost yeah. like they need the movie to be over in about 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, all right, let's wrap this shit up. And he left the theater to get more candy across the street, <laughs> according to the f- film synopsis here. Ugh. That's, yeah, yeah. Billy chases Stripe into a Montgomery, Montgomery Ward, where Stripe starts to climb into a water fountain and get more, you know, make more gremlins. Gizmo shows up in a toy car, <laughs> opens a skylight, getting Stripe with sunlight and melting him. And, you know, they defeated Stripe. It's actually a pretty grisly scene, mel- melting uh, Melton Stripe. Yes. So now that everything's taken care of, I'm sure the town has a lot of fucking questions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, guys, why don't you yeah. uh, call the police? Yeah. Mr. Wing shows up to get Gizmo. And he tells the Pelters, like, what the hell? You guys, you took my, you took my Mogwai and you fucked up this town. <laughs> and now I got to answer to the elders or something. I don't know. But he just thinks, you know, the Western world's not ready for the Mogwai. But he thinks, Billy, you might be able to take care of Gizmo one day. Yes. And Gizmo's, you know, he's become attached to Billy, so he's just like, you know, bye, Billy. <laughs> and Mr. Wing leaves with Gizmo. And that is, that's Gremlins in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. It's really... Oh, what a weird story. Yeah, man. Hmm. So... There was one sequel, 1990's Gremlins 2, The New Batch, which sees Billy working in an office building in New York City. And Gizmo escapes the old Chinese man and finds Billy. Soon, the Gremlins return, take over the building, with some of them gaining bizarre powers thanks to the building's R&D lab. It has an IMDb score of 6.4, Rotten Tomatoes score of 69%, and I give it an 8. I actually really like Gremlins 2. Cool, I'm going to check it out. It's very entertaining. I like it more than the first one. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out. <laughs> well, yeah, if you gave it an eight, yeah. I would hope you enjoyed it more than this. Yes, we just kind of bashed the shit out of it. Yes, we did. <laughs> Pretty harshly. But Sorry, guys. It deserves it, man. We don't coddle here. We just can't. We won't. No. Yeah. Here's some film guys and facts. In uh, number one, as we said earlier, in Cantonese, Mogwai means devil, demon, or gremlin. Number two, originally Stripe and Gizmo were the same character. This changed when Steven Spielberg insisted one of the gremlins be a good guy with whom the audience could identify. And I actually think this movie would be much better if Gizmo ended up becoming the bad guy. I think it would add some, you know, some morality into it. it would exactly. Give some stakes. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, some, some, some emotional stakes. Yeah, like getting vo- get invested. Yeah. Because I don't feel that. Yeah. Mm-mm. Number three, one of the studio notes to director Joe Dante and producer Steven Spielberg on seeing the first cut was that there were too many gremlins. Spielberg sarcastically suggested cutting them all out and calling the movie People. Oh my gosh. That is such a fucking suit thing to say. There's too many gremlins in this gremlins movie. Jeez, dude. Fucking idiots. How did those guys end up controlling the fate of movies? Ugh. Ridiculous. Number four. The time machine prop from the movie The Time Machine could be seen behind Randall Peltzer when he's on the phone with his wife at the convention. A moment later, the machine has disappeared to the astonishment of several onlookers. It's kind of a neat touch. This guy just made a fucking time machine. (laughs) Also attending the convention were Steven Spielberg, composer Jerry Goldsmith, and Robbie the Robot from Forbidden Planet. And number five, amongst others, the voices of the gremlins were done by Michael Winslow, otherwise known as the guy who makes funny noises from Police Academy. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So pretty cool. <laughs> and that's Gremlins. Seven out of ten for me. I just, it, it, I can't do it. I really want to, but it's, it's got too many problems, and it's, it's tough to enjoy. Yeah, I give it a big whopping five. I don't like, Woo! I don't, I don't like this movie. Damn. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see myself revisiting it like any time ever. I don't. <laughs> Yeah, unless, I think this is my last time. Unless my daughter, like, wants to watch it, but I'm going to try my best to be, like, you know... Steer her away from Gremlins. The Goonies! Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just want to point something out that's really interesting, I think, about... Yeah. 1984. Here are the top ten uh, highest grossing films from that year. Number one, Beverly Hills Cop. Really? Wow. Number, number two, Ghostbusters. Number three, Temple of Doom. Number four, Gremlins. Jesus. Number five, Karate Kid. <laughs> Six, 
Police Academy. <laughs> Seven, Footloose. Jesus. Eight, Romancing the Stone. Wow. Nine, Star Trek Three: Search for Spock. <laughs> Nine. And number ten, Splash. Dude, the 80s were so simple. <laughs> Woo! We did not need much. <laughs> right? You look, you look at it and you're just like, man, it's pretty, yeah, like, it's pretty simple-minded, like, here you go. Here's some half-assed, you know, I, I love I love Indiana Jones with all my heart, you know. Yeah. It's an awesome, awesome trilogy. But, um, you know, I, I just, as a whole, as a whole group of all ten, we're like, I'm just like, wow. Like you said, <laughs> it didn't take a lot to, uh... <laughs> To get people's attention, and you know, that's which, amazing. I mean, Gremlins is the, I mean, fourth. Which, which Star Trek was that? Star Trek Three. Yeah, and Star that's Trek number Star. nine. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, wow, incredible. <laughs> I can't believe number one is Beverly Hills Cop. Made two hundred thirty-four million dollars. Wow, here in the United States, that beat Indiana Jones that and beats... Ghostbusters and Gremlins. Wow. Karate Kid. Oh, pretty crazy, right? Beverly Hills Cop. The eighties are just a fascinating, fascinating decade. <laughs> Truly, and. um... You know, I'll go ahead and say we've we've mentioned it plenty of times. We 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 wanted to stick in the '80s for a bonus that's going to come up later. In the oh week. hell yeah! And so and we want to stick with Joe Dante and do one that we both really like, and one that we just both got to see at Draft House at a screening, and that would be 1989, The Burbs. The Burbs, awesome movie. <laughs> Satan is good. Satan is our pal. <laughs> Can't wait. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Tom Hanks, Bruce Dern, Rick yeah. Ducumin, Carrie Fisher. Great movie. It's it's the kind of shit Joe Dante is. Yeah, yeah, it's like a. a it's his unsung masterpiece. He's just an ace. Like it's, it's yeah. Bur- the Burbs. I, I can't wait to talk about it because I hope, I hope people are like as uh, excited about it as we are after we kind of dive back into it. Because it is to me, it should be one of those '80s movies that everybody is like, yeah. "Holy fuck, that's it like." Should be. B- but it's not quite there. Yeah. But but it has it has an audience, obviously. And uh, yeah, we're we're both two of those people. We love it. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> so much. So fun. that'll be exciting. Oh, I can't wait. So. Let's take a look at what happened this week in film. Oh, yeah. The previously announced Home Alone reboot has cast Archie Yates, Rob Delaney, and Ellie Kemper. Disney is going to be helming this after they got the rights uh, from the Fox buyout. Yeah. And I don't really, I don't care. Yeah. Mm. I'll never, no, I love Home Alone. The one and two, two of my favorite Christmas movies. Bang, bang, get in, get out. I don't need another one. No. <laughs> Especially when it, I read the plot synopsis and it's got something to do with like a priceless gem and some shit. I don't care. I just... I don't care. Do something Is new. it Uncut Gems? <laughs> no. We're good. <laughs> Home Alone 9. Uncut <laughs> Gems. And it is like the sixth Home Alone movie. It's ridiculous. I think it is six, actually. Yeah. Yeah, because they kept doing TV movies. Yeah, because... Well, they did... Yeah, they had that third one, which was like in Chicago. And there was the fourth <laughs> one. I don't know if that got a theatrical release, but yeah. No. The, the fifth one was like on Hallmark or some shit. I don't know, yeah. dude. I, I don't know. I don't know. Ridiculous. A remake of Stephen King's The Dark Half has been greenlit, so cool. I ha- I don't know that story. I haven't read that one yet. Neither do I. Yeah. I know it's got something to do with an author's uh, pen name coming to life and killing people, which is kind of cool. Yeah it's, a, yeah, it's great. There was a 90s uh, movie made out of this story by uh, George Romero. There you go. So, actually really hard to find. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see that, but I'm going to read the book first. That's, that's my, that's my uh, ritual with King. Next up, The Matrix 4 and John Wick 4 are scheduled to both be released on May 21st, 2021. So it's Keanu versus Keanu. That's great. <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of people are just going to go ahead and do the double feature. Yeah. Fuck it. That's probably what I'm going to be you doing. You can't make me choose between that, those two movies. No, no. Uh, but really, which one are you more excited for? John really? Wick 4. You are? John Wick 4. See, I'm, I'm more excited for Matrix. I don't need another Matrix movie. I don't need it, but but I'm not a big fan of 2 or 3. The Matrix, and if they could, I, which I think they wouldn't be doing it, Keanu wouldn't be doing it if they aren't going to capture that magic again from 99. I believe. Eh, I believe. I don't know. Because the Wachowski's track record, not exactly oh, it's horrible. gold standard. It's, hor- it's horrible. Yeah, I'm not going to be. And Keanu nice about will it. do anything to please his fans. He cares more about his fans than any celebrity well, on yeah, the planet. Yeah, he's doing a Bill and Ted. Yeah. 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 So I feel like if the fans want Matrix 4, he'll do Matrix 4 regardless of how good the story is. And whereas John Wick 4. All three of those movies have kicked ass. And, and it's still happening. They've it's all like, got the yeah, right people involved. It's happened within the past decade, yeah. yeah, yeah. And <laughs> it's kick ass, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm just, man, The Matrix. <laughs> I'm still going to see both of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next up, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss are going to be helming a film about horror author H.P. Lovecraft. And they are the two assholes who fucked up Game of Thrones and lost their Star Wars franchise because of it. 
and I don't want to see their Lovecraft movie. I don't, I don't care about anything they do. They've proven their inability as storytellers. So yeah. fuck them. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. I do want to see a movie about Lovecraft, just not not theirs. <laughs> Next up, character actor and Oscar nominee Danny Aiello has died at age 86 of an undisclosed infection. He was nominated for his role in 1989's Do the Right Thing, and he also appeared in Moonstruck, Leon the Professional, and Jacob's Ladder, among others. He will be missed. Very much so. Yeah. My gosh. So sad. Mm-hmm. It's devastating, man. It's That's going to happen, though, more and more. Um, these people that... Because, you know, films have only been around, you know, like... It, American film, you know, since, you know, 1900, it's been a little over 100 years, you know, around 100 years, so we're going to see guys that, like, have been influences and been big and uh, back in the 70s and 80s and 90s and so on start to pass away because that's just how time works, Yeah. and it's really fucking sad that we're seeing, like, it just comes in waves, and you're just going to see artists that were huge for what happened before you and I. Well, dude, as of you know, next as of next year, the set the 1970 is 50 years ago. Yeah, that's yeah. insane. Yeah, it's really <laughs> wild. It really is. So yeah, man, it's it's sad, but we are going to be seeing some more recognizable, you know, thought, you know, younger faces mm-hmm. taken off. Yeah, it's a damn shame. That's yeah. Time is a bitch. Time is a bitch. Next up, Thomas Jane has formed a new production company, Renegade Entertainment, and he plans to adapt the Stephen King novel from a Buick 8 as one of his first projects. Awesome. Sweet. It's another one of his I've never read. <laughs> That's great. What a cool name. Renegade. Renegade Entertainment. Thomas Jane. Renegade's a Funk's always been one of my favorite Rage songs. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, it's a cool one. <laughs> from a Buick 8. I'm going to have to read that one. <laughs> Next from up, a Buick is- 6 is a great song by uh, <laughs> Bob Dylan there. <laughs> Frozen 2 has surpassed $1 billion global box office. It's not really a surprise. I think we all knew that was going to happen. Yeah. Frozen two, Frozen was big for Disney. Frozen 2 is even bigger. And I didn't see it, and I don't plan to. Nah, I'm good. David Ayer is in talks to write and direct a remake of The Dirty Dozen. It's very interesting. I have never seen The Dirty Dozen. I'm super interested in this. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating, Fascinating tidbit <laughs> of news. I'm not that... I, I haven't seen enough of David Ayer's work to call myself a fan. Yeah, That's same. It. But you know, like, there's enough, like, history there where you're like, I'm intrigued. Just, yes. Like, wow, this is happening. I'm very intrigued. <laughs> there's so many things hap- that, that are going to keep happening, like, throughout, I think, throughout the um, the next decade, the, the 20s. Whoa. Um, I, think, I think a lot of things are going to happen where things are kind of resurrected, like we've seen recently, like Halloween, stuff like that. Where it's not just massive big things that are going to make a billion dollars. It's also stuff for like fans, like like Halloween, where it's it's more for people like you and I. It's more for or someone who loves this, loves that. You know, like Little Women. That's such a cool thing for a certain fan group. You know, I feel like that's going to keep happening more and more, where these stories are being retold or revamped and just fucking heightened. The quality is just well, you on a can remake level. anything if yeah. you get the right people involved and you put care and attention into it. Yeah, and, and that's you, the part that gets forgotten in this process is people don't give a fuck about it. Yes, yeah, just like care a little yeah. bit. It's how you end up with a Black Christmas or a Jacob's Ladder, which I bet most people didn't even fucking know came out. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, yeah, because yeah, nobody man. cares. Yeah, but then you get you know a Halloween where the right people wanted it to be good. People who were fans when they were kids, yeah, they grew up and they're like, let me fucking yeah. Mm-hmm. We got Ghostbusters coming up. Come on, yeah, Ghostbusters. Right men, right men. Come on, like, yeah, it's crazy, you know. <laughs> It's just cool. It's a cool time, you know. Um, and that also goes along with, like, we were talking about people who pass away. Now these people carry the torch, and they're like, hey, here we go. Like, this is what I can show you, you know? Yes. And let's carry it on. It's, it's just beautiful to watch. That's that's <laughs> art. That's what art is, you know, is people inspiring and challenging each other and making better stuff, consistently trying to get better. And that's what we're here for. It's like, <laughs> bring it. We're ready to consume it. <laughs> oh, hell yeah, man. <laughs> All the good content. And finally, Blumhouse is planning a remake of Firestarter with writer-director Keith Thomas, whose debut horror film, The Vigil, is set for release next year. I liked Firestarter. I thought it was a great book. I thought the movie was actually not bad. That's a rare opinion, isn't it? Of the movie? Oh, yeah. Most people hate that movie. It's Drew Barrymore, right? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Oh, I think we have it on our schedule at some point. We do have it on our schedule for Um, early next year. Yeah. But... (laughs) Uh, Yeah, no, I'm excited to see it. I've never seen it, and I definitely haven't read it. It's such a cool story. But the biggest issue of the movie is that George C. Scott plays a Native American. Ah, there you go. And that is tough. 
That's frustrating. He's got like a black braid. Yeah. And he's no, jo- he's not... he's fucking Patton as <laughs> Native well, yeah, American yeah. John Rainbird, this assassin. Such a cool character in the book. Such a goddamn joke That's in tough. the movie. But uh, yeah. I like the movie, you know? I'm excited to watch it. And I'm excited to see them do it again. Because with the right, like, if, you know, CGI, this could be fucking creepy. Really cool. Oh, boy. Cool. Oh, boy. And that is all for this week. Next Wednesday is Christmas. So what better horror film to discuss than the 1974 slasher classic Black Christmas? Oh, yes. A group of sorority girls are murdered on Christmas Eve by a killer known only as Billy with no rhyme or reason. It's a holly jolly bloodbath next week on Filmgasm. Until then, you know the rules. No sunlight, no water, and never, ever feed them after midnight. <laughs>